these approaches are useful in machine learning and can do useful things for you. So it's going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour of some topological data analysis techniques. I'm not going to cover everything in the field or even a small portion of it, but it's more to give you an idea and a taste of why this sort of approach is worth learning more about. And at the end of the day, the goal of this is to build some sound mathematical theory, but still, at the end of the day, have useful practical applications. So we're going to start off covering a little bit of the mathematical theory at a high level, just to kind of give you a, a general flavor of how this approach thinks about data. And then we're going to go through and look at how this could be applied in practice on some more real world problems. So to start with, we're going to have a short primer on topology. So the first thing I want to introduce to you is this notion of simplices. Now these are little tiny building blocks of dimensional spaces. So a zero simplex there is simply a point. That's easy. A one simplex you build by putting together two, uh, two zero simplices and just assuming there's some span between those things. A two simplex you put together three zero simplices and just fill in the convex hull span and so on up. So you can create a very simple object of however many dimensions you like. The key here is that I just built them up in a very simple combinatorial way so you can actually deal with complex continuous topology in a way that just works in simple finite combinatorial terms that you can put on a computer in an easy way. So these aren't very interesting spaces, but you can glue together these simplices along their faces and build uh, a thing called a simplicial complex. That's just a bunch of these simplices all glued together in a useful sort of way. And the key here is that pretty much any interesting topological space that you're going to account encounter in data analysis can be built in exactly this way. Not all topological spaces. Topology is a pretty broad subject. It has nasty, horrible, pathological spaces that do very nasty things, and you want to avoid those, and these won't represent those. But that's okay because we're essentially never going to encounter them. So this model of building topology is good enough to do the job. And as I said, the key here is it's all finite, combinatorial, simple to work with on a computer. So next is a theorem. And this is a picture of a theorem. You don't have to read the theorem or understand what it's saying. The meat of what's going on here is that it's telling us that if you construct a simplicial complex in a suitable way from some data, it's going to capture all the relevant topology of that space you built it from. So if you have one of these interesting topological spaces with all this continuous, infinite uh, dynamics, you can turn that into a simple, finite, combinatorial object, this simplicial complex, and capture most everything you need to know. And that's really all this theorem is saying. But what it means is that there's a lot of actual deep, rich, underlying mathematics that formalizes all of this and makes it all sound. So let's have an example so we can see sort of what we're talking about here. So let's take some points, some data, and color code it by position on a manifold. There's sort of a, a warped linear manifold going on here amongst this data. And what we're going to do is we're going to create an open cover of it, which is really just placing an open ball around each point. And this gives us a cover of the space. And then we're going to take the, the nerve of it. That was the, what that nerve theorem was talking about. And all that really is, is whenever two of these balls intersect, I'm going to draw one simplex between the two points. Whenever three of those balls intersect each other in a triple intersection, I'm going to draw a two simplex convex hull around the, the three points and so on up, and that's all we're really doing. That sounds really simple, and it sounds kind of too simplistic to work, but that theorem tells us that, in fact, it captures the topology we care about. So there's deep underlying math that tells us that this should actually work. And in this case, that does actually capture a lot of that structure we were caring about. This is a, a really toy example, so you know you probably could have inferred this yourself just by staring at it, but it's going to work in much higher dimensional spaces and more complex examples later. Now, you should also note that this didn't entirely work. It's not really perfect, and we're going to come back to why that's not working later when we start trying to apply this in more practical terms. 
So the next thing I want to go through is a bunch of language from math that are underlying ideas that matter. Uh, I, I don't need you to understand the, the formal definitions of these things, but I want to introduce you to these sorts of words and ways of thinking about things because what is involved here is that while I'm going to explain the intuition of what these things mean, there's a, a rigorous formalism that actually makes these general intuitive ideas that I'm about to explain true. So what is a, a functor? Well, it's essentially a function between domains of discourse. And that sounds very general, but what we're talking about here is something like taking the nerve of that open cover. We started with a topological space, which is continuous and complicated, and we turned it into this finite combinatorial object where we can just work in pure combinatorics land. So we went from topology to combinatorics. And having a functor is basically a formal way of saying, no, no, we can do this in a fully rigorous way that makes sense. I'm not, you're not just waving your hands and going, well, something like that. It's formalizable. And, and a junction is basically having a pair of functors that go back and forth between two different domains of discourse. And what it's really saying is you have a way of translating back and forth from one to the other that's not quite perfect, but it's close, as close as you can get to an equivalence between these two different domains of discourse. I'll, I'll keep going, I'll take questions at the end, sorry. All right, so uh, the next one is a limit. So the way to think about this is a solution to a system of constraints. And by system of constraints, I really mean in a very general sense here, but the key is that once again, you can actually formalize all of this, but the intuitions are the right sort of intuitions to take. We can find the solution that's gonna solve this constraint system in a, in a formalizable mathematical way. And alternatively, co-limits magically glue together complex systems of objects into a single coherent whole in the simplest possible way according to this underlying theory of mathematics that's doing all this. This is all incredibly abstract and I've hand waved about the intuitions of what these words mean, but do they actually do anything in practice? That's what we really wanna know. So what can we use all this abstract nonsense that I've been talking about for? Well, first of all, let's start with dimension reduction. That's a common problem in unsupervised learning. You have some very high dimensional data and you'd like to either be able to visualize it or at least get it down to a low enough dimension that you could say run clustering on it or something like that. And you want to reduce the dimension of it in a way that tries to preserve as much of the structure of the data as possible. Well, what do we mean by the structure of the data? Well, we're talking about the interrelationships between the different data points. And when you're talking about interrelationships, you're really talking about topology. So topology is the right mathematics to use to tackle this problem. So let's go back to our example that we had earlier. It was a nice toy example. And this didn't work. And the question you should be asking yourself is why was this not actually doing what that theorem said it would? Well, the theorem said that it's had an open cover of the topological space. And if you remember, back when I drew those balls over each of the points, the little circles around them, it didn't cover the whole space. There were gaps between them. And so there was a notional manifold in between that we weren't covering. So that's what it's not capturing. So really, our problem was that the data was not uniformly distributed on the manifold, there were gaps in the data if we just took a uniform sized ball around each point. If the data was uniformly distributed on the manifold, then this would be great and it would all work. And if you, you know, redistribute that data so it's nice and uniform along this notional manifold that we had, you can see we would get all the intersections we'd want and this would reduce down to topologically just a nice sequence of, of lines. So, that is what we want. We want data to be uniformly distributed on our manifold. When is that ever true in practice with real world data? Well, the answer is it's not. So how do I, a mathematician, deal with this problem? I just assume it to be true because I can. But that actually has implications. If I assume the data is uniformly distributed on this manifold, that means something about how the manifold itself is structured. So what that has to mean is that there's some 
notion of distance on this manifold that is different than whatever the ambient space is implying that makes this data uniformly distributed. So I have to find how to reinterpret my notion of distance locally around each point so that the data is uniformly distributed. So uh, a quick refresher on manifolds. Uh, manifolds and manifold learning get tossed around a lot in data science and machine learning, and no one usually goes to the trouble of actually defining what they're talking about. They just mean a curvy, surfacey space type thing. Now, in practice, mathematically what we mean is that it's a thing where you can take a small region of that space and it should look exactly like standard Euclidean space or at least have a natural map to it. So there's a bunch of patches that all can be glued together to form this manifold and each of those patches we can map to a nice Euclidean space that makes sense and everything's standard and normal there. So in a sense what we're doing here is saying that each of these patches is going to have a different notion of distance, a different way of rescaling itself. And so under that notion of distance the data is going to be uniformly distributed. So that's, that's, that's how we're going to cheat and make the data uniformly distributed. Okay, there's another assumption that I'm going to make and that is that the manifold is locally connected. And you don't need right now to worry about what that means. What it means in practice is that those nasty pathological topological spaces that I talked about that are going to ruin everything and not be able to be modeled with a simplicial complex won't happen. <laughs> We're going to get rid of those by requiring this to be true. We don't want a nasty, horrible uh, topological space that's, that's not going to work out. So if we combine all that together, we end up with an open cover that looks more like this, where it's going to be fuzzy as our confidence in this notion of distance around a given point declines. It's going to be solid out to the first point so that we're locally connected, and it's going to fade away from there because we don't really know that much about the metric. We're going to lose confidence in it as we go. But we left something out, which is that all these local metrics that I'm defining are incompatible. So we approximated a different notion of distance around each data point. And I might have one data point that thinks that this other data point over here is really close. But this data point over here might think that this data point is really far away. They're not going to agree on how far away each other are. So how can we deal with that? Well, what's going on is that in manifold land, in the nice theoretical sense, there's these patches that uh, locally look like RN, but wherever they overlap, there's down at the bottom of, of this diagram, there's actually maps given for how to map between overlaps between these. And with our finite data, we don't have that. We're lacking it. That's the theoretical data that will make this a nice manifold, and we're just short of that. So what can we do? Well, I talked about co-limits and said it was the notional right way to just glue a whole bunch of stuff together into the sort of simplest possible object that glues it all in a natural way. So we should glue these metric spaces together with co-limits would be the way to think about this in these topological terms. The problem is that metric spaces, uh, the category of metric spaces doesn't have co-limits. You actually just can't do that. It doesn't work. So how do we get around that problem? Well, the solution is to transfer our problem to a different domain. Whenever you get stuck in one domain, change your way of looking at the problem, work with it in a different space, and maybe there it'll be easier. So it turns out that there's more nice theory. Again, this is a picture of a theorem. You don't need to care about the details. It's more just saying a theorem exists. And all it's really saying is that we can transfer these metric spaces over to some other space of fuzzy simplicial sets, again, don't worry about the details right now, where maybe this stuff can work. And importantly, this is an adjunction, and I talked about that. That's basically saying it's sort of a minimal translation back and forth that does as good a job of being accurate at going back and forth between these two different domains as possible. So this is kind of an optimal translation between these two different domains of discourse, metric spaces and this other space where we can take co-limits and this whole thing resolves itself very simply. So what we get out is a fuzzy simplicial set, which looks a lot like those simplicial complexes we were just talking about earlier. In fact, that's exactly how you should think about it. The math is slightly different, but the intuition is entirely the same. The only difference is it's now 
fuzzy in the sense that some of those simplices are more there than others. So the existence of a simplex sort of has a probabilistic notion. It's sort of a, a probability that this edge exists in the graph. And you should perhaps think of it that way if that's much easier. It's really just a probabilistic graph. It's vertices, which were our data points, and edges where there's a probability that that edge exists. So suppose now we were given a low dimensional representation of the data. How were we given it? Well, maybe we just started with randomly distributed data. It might not be very good low dimensional representation, but it is one. Maybe we can do better and find a better initialization, a better starting point. There are natural ways to do that, but let's just assume we got one via some approach. So we can apply the same process I just talked about to get a probabilistic graph associated to that data. And now all we have to do is ask ourselves, how close is this to the one that our source data generated. And there's a natural way to write that down as sort of a cross-entropy type equation. I mean, these are Bernoulli probabilities. We can just do cross-entropy. That makes sense. And that measures how close each graph is to the other. And then because there's gradients we can associate with this, we can just do a gradient descent and move the data around in the low dimensional space until we get a result that gives us a graph that looks as close as possible to the one from the high dimensional space. So what we're really saying is we want the topological structure in the low dimensional space to look as much like the topological structure in the high dimensional space as possible. So in practice, this is kind of a force directed graph layout algorithm. And what that means is we've got this term on the left, which is going to basically pull together points that are quite closely connected and pull things into clumps that are, are sort of close together in the high dimensional space. And alternatively, wherever things are far apart in the high dimensional space, it's going this other uh, right hand term is going to push them apart. So one side of this equation is going to get the clumps right, the other side of this equation is going get, to get the gaps right, and that's going to be how we're going to get our low dimensional representation. So the question is, that you should be asking yourselves at this point, that was a nice explanation of some math, but I bet it doesn't really work which is a fair question. So does it actually work in practice on real data? This isn't quite real data, but it's close enough. This is MNIST digits data. Uh, so these are uh, handwritten digits in as 28 by 28 pixel grayscale images. So 28 by 28 pixels ends up being 784 dimensions. So we started with 784 dimensional data and we found the topological representation in only two dimensions that most closely approximates that. And I've colored this by the actual number that that handwritten digit represents. And what you'll see is that you've got down in the bottom left corner uh, a long, tall, skinny clump of ones. On the far right-hand side, you've got the zeros. And then you've got groups of uh, digits that look kind of similar, like four, seven, and nine up in the top left corner or eight, five, and three in the middle. And if you think about you know, how those digits would look when handwritten, they do look kind of similar to each other. It's pulled them apart into distinct clumps, but it does a good enough job. Here's that algorithm running on fashion MNIST data. So this is uh, images of fashion items, things like uh, bags, shirts, dresses, boots, sandals, and so on. And you'll see it's separated out most of the classes. It hasn't done a perfect job which you should always be suspicious when somebody presents you only perfect solutions. <laughs> but it's done about as well as one might hope, and it's done things that make sense, like separating out the trousers and the footwear as clearly distinct clumps that are, the footwear is all together. There's boots and sandals and sneakers on the right-hand side there, and then trousers separated out well down in the bottom. So it's doing a pretty good job. Uh, another example, this is Kazushi MNIST, this is uh, handwritten uh, Japanese calligraphy characters. There are quite a few different classes of these. And you can see, again, it still does a remarkable job of picking out the right classes and pulling them apart in a nice way. So overall, this is working pretty well in practice. But we've got some good theory behind this, so we can go even further. We could do something along the lines of metric learning. So here is an approach with Siamese and triplet networks from 
uh, the Fashion MNIST data set. And the, the goal here is to take the labeled data and use that labeled information to try and find an embedding of the data that best respects the labels. And this is using fancy neural networks to do that job. This is about as well as it does. On the left-hand side is the embedding of the training set. And then we have new data samples. And what we want to be able to do is embed them in that existing uh, uh, embedding and get out a result that should hopefully still have distances be meaningful in that space. But if we used the approach I've just been describing to do that sort of thing, we get something like this. Now, again, it's not perfect. You can see on the, on the case in the right, in the test set, there's cases where data's been misclassified in a sense, but not only have we separated out the classes all pretty cleanly, there's internal structure to each of those. In the, in the earlier example, you just get blobs. But here, each of those clusters has an internal structure that makes sense. So there's metric information within the classes as well. So we're learning quite a lot about our data via this approach. So there's, I feel, a good example of how topology can actually do a really useful, practical job. OK, here's another thing you could do with topology. Word embeddings. Now, this is still a little bit of work in progress. I wanted to share it anyway. Uh, my colleague John Healy, who's in the audience, will give a talk later on tomorrow, uh, which will cover related ideas and even get into some of this in a little more detail. Uh, it's also work with Colin Weir at the Tut Institute, where I work. I'm going to just run through it fairly quickly. So the, the general idea behind word embeddings, like word to vec and Glove and fast text and related algorithms, the core idea at, at the heart of it all is something called the distributional hypothesis of language. And that's summarized by this, this quote from uh, John Firth, which is that you shall know a word by the company it keeps. So in a sense, another way to think about that is if you want to know what a word means, the first thing you're going to do is say, well, can you use it in a sentence for me? And maybe if you have it used in a sentence, you can learn a bit about what it means. If you have it used in a lot of sentences, maybe you could actually start to learn a lot. So this is the core idea that's going into this sort of approach. Interestingly, all the fancy math I talked about in terms of category theory with functors and limits and so on actually has a theorem that says that this should actually work. It's called the Yoneda lemma. And this is actually, it turns out, really just an intuitive re restatement of that deep underlying mathematical fact, which I think is just a, a, a cute aside, but we'll leave it there. So what we're going to do is represent a word as a multinomial distribution of the words that it co-occurs with. So one way to think about that is if you want to define a word by using it in a lot of sentences, you could make up a document of all the sentences that use that word in some giant training corpus. So I'm just going to pull out just the sentences that use this one word, stick them all together, and call that a big document. And how do you deal with documents? Well, you make a bag of words model of it, and you just got counts of how many times each different word in the vocabulary is used. And that's how we're representing our word. We're, we're representing it as the document of all uses of that word in our training corpus. And then we're going to just turn that into a multinomial by just normalizing it to get the probabilities. So the downside of that is it's a very large and very sparse matrix. What I mean is it's super high dimensional. It's vocabulary sized dimensional. So this could easily be 20,000, 100,000 dimensional data. How do you usefully use that representation? Well, the goal would be to find the manifold on which the words lie. So here, we're going back to that assumption of locally connected. And that's what's going to save us from this very, very high dimensional data. Because it turns out one of the problems with high dimensional data is it just doesn't behave the way you normally think it does. So here's a plot of a dis the distribution of distances to the 20 nearest neighbors of just random Gaussian distributions in two dimensions in blue, eight dimensions in green, 32 dimensions in red, 128 dimensions in purple. And you can see the trend of where this is going. All these distances just move further and further up. In high dimensional space, all distances are really quite large. Now, generally, you only really care about how distances compare to each other. 
So effectively, you're going to normalize all the distances back by dividing, essentially, by the largest distance. Well, if we did that with these distances, what we get is this. And now, as we go up dimensions, everything's at least on the same scale. But the very high dimensional distances are now an incredibly narrow spike. So essentially, in high dimensional spaces, all distances look essentially equivalently the same. So it's, you can't tell the difference between different distances between different objects. Everything looks the same distance away from everything else. But if we take this locally connected assumption into account and apply that as we go, what we get is this. And here we see now that the distribution of distances under this uh, transformation stays pretty much the same as we go up dimensions. So we can work in ridiculously high dimensional spaces and still retain all the information we want. And that came not from some heuristic, but from a deep underlying fact about what we wanted the topological space to look like. It should be locally connected. So now it's just a matter of finding the connect, correct metric to work from multinomial parameter space. And for that, you need to go to information geometry from the 50s, which basically constructed a whole theory of distributions living on a manifold, and there's geodesic distances between distributions on manifolds. This is all fine. You, you push it all through, and there's a closed form formula that's actually surprisingly simple. I believe it's in John's talk, and you can see it there. The end result is that this is an example of Yelp reviews embedded with this approach. So these are all words from Yelp reviews, and you can see that even though we went from a ridiculously high dimensional representation of this data down to just two via this approach, it's captured huge amounts of information about the similarity among words. There's faucet and baths and showers and dryers up in the top right hand corner. Down in the bottom, you've got all the different kinds of food. Over to the side of that, on the right hand side, next to all the food are all the drinks. And it has understood a huge amount of information about the data just from looking at how words co-occur with each other, vectorizing that, and then reducing the dimension via manifold learning technique that I just described in the previous section. So, not only can we do dimension reduction, we can do word embeddings with topology. What else can we do? Well, how about clustering? That's another big outstanding problem in unsupervised learning. There are lots of clustering techniques. What would a topological clustering technique look like? Well, first, we have to ask what we mean by a cluster, because it's hard to define clusters well. There are lots of different definitions depending on what exactly is the outcome you're trying to achieve from this. So, for our purposes here, I'm going to follow a density-based clustering notion that sort of follows uh, Hardigan and, and other ideas like that. So, the goal is that a cluster is a connected component of a superlevel set of the probability density function of the underlying and unknown distribution from which the data samples were drawn. You should probably ask what that means. It's fair. Let's look at an example, work through it, and it'll all be quite clear. Here's some test data, and let's look at what that means on this test data set for clustering. There's notionally some sort of heat map of the probability density function that was underlying this data. This data was drawn from some func probability density function where data is more likely to occur in some areas of the space, less likely to occur in others. As so you can imagine, there's a heat map where the purple is the very likely for data to occur, the yellow is rather unlikely, and so on. That's their probability density function from which the data was drawn. We can take level sets on that. That makes perfect sense, and you should be able to pick a given sort of level set contour line, and look at that. Now, given this particular choice of contour line, there are connected components, basically different groups there, and each of those is going to lasso a different group of data. And each of those groups of data that are going to be lassoed, that's going to be our clusters, and any data that's not lassoed by that contour line, that's just going to be background noise that we're not going to worry about. So, how do we compute any of that without knowing this probability density function? Because if we knew that, we'd, we'd really pretty much be done from the start. The whole point is you have some data and it just showed up. You don't know how it was generated. So, let's take some even more toy data just to work through this example and see how this could work. So, here's our very toy data set. And the assumption 
is that the data is distributed on the manifold according to some probability density function. Not uniformly distributed, but according to some probability density function. So what if when we are doing uh, our approach, instead of choosing a Ramanian metric that makes the, the data uniformly distributed, we choose one that makes the data, uh, preserves that distribution. Or in fact, importantly, because there's often noise in data, emphasizes that distribution to try and filter out a lot of that noise. Well, we can do that. We're going to run into the same problem we had before. All our local metrics are going to be incompatible with each other, potentially. So, how could we solve that? Well, really, we, we want the minimal possible solution to this. So this time around, we're really more solving this as a system of constraints. So we should be taking limits. But once again, metric spaces, limits, it doesn't work as well as you'd like. So what we want to do is change your domain of discourse, change how we're thinking about this problem to somewhere else where all this formalism goes through cleanly. And we can do that. We already saw that there's a theorem that says how to go about doing that. So now what we get is, again, if you like, a probabilistic graph. You can imagine higher dimensional simplices involved in this. And again, I've colored it essentially by the probability of the edge existing. And you can see that, in a sense, we've actually captured some notion of the topology of that probability density function with that approach. So we've managed to turn this into something that captures that elusive unknown probability density function, or at least the topology of it. So now there's a magical functor that goes from uh, simplicial complexes to their connected components. And it really is as simple as you think. It's just the connected components of the thing. That turns a simplicial complex into a set. We're changing from one domain of discourse, simplicial complexes, to a simple one, sets. Well, we had a fuzzy simplicial complex. So instead, we get a fuzzy set. So it's a fuzzy set of connected components. And as long as we exclude components that are below a, a minimum threshold of cluster size and sort points by their component membership, we can get a thing that looks sort of like this. Here are the points along the, along the x-axis. I've sorted the points according to which cluster they belong to when, and the membership strength running up the uh, y-axis there. And you can pick out clusters from this according to their membership strengths in all sorts of ways. You can use information theoretic techniques. You can use persistence-based techniques. You could just take the leaves, viewing this as a tree. Whichever of those techniques you want to use, and they all end up looking surprisingly similar, you can get out a clustering. And on our very toy data set, that clustering looks like this, which should be the clustering you expected to get out of that toy data set. But what about on more complex data? What about that test data set I showed earlier where we had the much more interesting, strange looking probability density function? Well, this is the clustering you would get out on that sort of data. And so even in the presence of a lot of noise, this approach behaves extremely well. All the data that's colored gray there is data that this clustering algorithm considered noise and said, you don't need to worry about this. These are not clusters. Just ignore that, ignore that data for now. And so this is, a, turns out, a very, very powerful clustering algorithm that works very well in practice. OK, what else could we do? Well, oddly enough, I talked about all those membership strengths. We could ask the question, what's the probability, in a sense, that any given data point is in any connected component? That's a fair question to ask. And it's trivial to compute, given what we've computed so far. The end result is that we can build a heat map that looks like this on our data. This is the probability that the data is in any connected component, which is essentially an anomaly detection technique. So the less likely the data is to be in any connected component of our probability density function, the less likely the data is to occur, the more anomalous it is. So all the data colored dark purple and blue here is data that this approach says is highly anomalous. But it's done more than that because we've got a gradient within the data that's sort of clustered there. There's the top uh, left-hand cluster, which it thinks is sort of anomalous because it's not as clumped as a lot of the other data in general. So it's a, a, a fairly smooth notion, and it's very interpretable. It really is just the probability that the data is in, in any connected component of this probability density function. All right, so conclusions. <laughs> 
topology and category theory, which was the other language I was pulling out there, provide a different language to frame these sorts of problems than uh, sort of standard classical statistical thinking. But these are actually very powerful techniques, and they're worth using because they help you transfer problems among different ways of thinking about a problem in nice, natural ways. And in practice, they can provide very effective uh, solutions that work on real world data sets. So, <clears throat> so hopefully, I've motivated you to learn more. That was really the point of this talk. You should look more into these sorts of approaches because they have real value, but are often overlooked. Thank you. Have you published this somewhere? Uh, so the dimension reduction technique is published. Uh, and the code for it is, in fact, open source and readily available on GitHub. And in fact, that algorithm was recently included in uh, NVIDIA's uh, Rapids AI program. So you can even use it on GPUs, if you like. Uh, the word embedding is not yet published. As I said, that's a work in progress. And the clustering. There are related clustering algorithms that can be framed in almost exactly these terms. Uh, HDB scan would be the thing to look up, and that is published. Um, and there are actually several papers on it. Uh, references? Uh, I, I don't have them off the top of my head. Come talk to me later, and, and we, can, we can go through that. OK, thank you. Could you recommend a book or? Some small primer, or like you, 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 you brushed over a lot of stuff in the first 20 minutes. For those of us who are interested in going a little deeper, where can we go? I, that is an excellent question, and I apologize for brushing over a lot of stuff in 20 minutes, but uh, I wanted to cover both a little bit of the motivating ideas and hopefully uh, enough of the practical applications to motivate you to actually look into it. So, assuming that that seems to have worked, uh, at least one uh, book that is a good place to start is called uh, Elementary Applied Topology by Robert Grice. Uh, it is on the mathier side, but he does an excellent job of going through these sorts of ideas in a very slow sort of way with lots of pictures. Uh, he actually is an amazing illustrator as well of extremely abstract concepts, and that's an excellent place for a, a sort of broad introduction to these sorts of topological ideas. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, oh. Oh, sorry, uh, the book was Elementary Applied Topology. Robert Greist, G-H-R-I-S-T. Um, do you have problems with uniqueness of connected components, and how do you handle that? Like, for instance, even with persistence, with, when you go to different level sets and so on, you might have different connected components. Uh, uh, so, uh, oddly enough, uh, the... Uh, Connected components all glue together in a very nice way. And it turns out that uh, if you do this in the category theoretic approach, uh, it magically all glues it together for you in exactly the way you want. Otherwise, you can actually just glue them together as a tree. Uh, the connected components of level sets of any sort of topological space turn out to actually be representable as a graph at the end of the day if you do it right. So in fact, it actually all glues together nicely and resolves itself. So I, I agree that is a, a complicated problem that you could potentially have. It turns out that it all just works anyway. Do you have problems with uniqueness, though? Uh, what do you mean by uniqueness? You get different connected components sometimes. Uh, you mean for different runs? Uh, or Different clusters. Different what could cluster together differently. Um, this defines a notion of what should be a cluster. So yeah. you're bound by what the algorithm will claim. Hi there. You said the code was on GitHub. Uh, could you point me in the right direction for that? Uh, yeah. Okay. So on GitHub, uh, github.com slash L McInnes, L-M-C-I-N-N-E-S slash UMAP. Um, I know there's a company called uh, Ayasdi that was trying to do something similar. They're trying to apply topological techniques uh, to problems. Uh, I mean, do you have any sense of how effective uh, they are, or like, you know? Uh, I can't speak to that. I don't have any affiliation with Ayasdi, uh, so I don't know exactly what they're doing. They have 
different approaches that they are applying, I don't know how effective they are. They're a for-profit company, and they seem to hold their cards pretty close to their chest on what they're doing. So I, I can't speak to that. Sorry. Okay, of no course. Does anyone have a question? Okay, let's give a round of applause.